in terms of a founding team, you want to have a good balance of people who are technical, probably at least one person that's more business oriented. But I think we're fairly open minded and wanting to assess what about this founding team is going to be the reason why they actually succeed. Hey friends, welcome to Smart Venture Podcast, the best information for future CEOs. Starting a company is easy, but growing and managing it is hard. In this podcast, we sit down with the best founders, experienced leaders, and investors in tech and relevant space to give you the best tips to grow your company and grow yourself. If you like it, don't forget to subscribe and give it a five star. Hi, <laughs> thank you so much for coming on the show. So I have to say, like, you are super impressive yourself. And then you were、uh, working for Goldman Sachs as a VP there, and then before you joined Floodgate. So I would love to, you know, so to, for today's episode, we're gonna go back to that. You're a little bit like when you were younger. Like, what were you doing when you were in, I guess, like kindergarten or like I'm not. Well, I'm kidding, but like maybe elementary school or something. Basically, how did you grow up, and then how did you get into like where you are now? Yeah, I was born in the states, but then I actually lived in Korea from when I was one until I was five. And so when we moved back to the states, I didn't speak any English, and I grew up in a small town, going to the public schools of Pacific Grove, California, and that is not that racially diverse.、Uh, so much so that I may have been the first student that needed English as a second language <laughs> classes, and it was so challenging that the school actually called my parents and said, "She doesn't speak English. We're not quite sure if she has learning disabilities or she's mentally challenged." Mm-hmm. And my mom is a physician, <laughs> so、uh, the good news is, you know, my mom would have been able to rather, you know, spot the signs if that were the case. And of course, their response was, "No, she's just never spoken or heard English because we just moved here from Korea, and we need to get our special teachers." And it was hard, right? Because being a minority in a community where you feel like you're being marginalized because、uh, people don't know other people like you is a really challenging experience, and. And when I look back at that, I think that what my childhood taught me was that I needed to be resilient and I needed to be willing to take control over situations and figure out a way to not only survive but really thrive.、Um, and it, I think it also taught me a broader lesson, which is. Everyone lives their own experiences,、um, and so I can't speak to other people's experiences. But I do know what it's like to be marginalized and have people assume things about you because you don't fit the mold of what they're looking for. And you know, I grew up going to the public school systems in Pacific Grove, and one one of the few people from my high school that left the state of California. And I'm still the same person that they thought was mentally challenged in kindergarten when I showed up from Korea, and so I'm just a big believer in giving people a chance and not assuming that because they don't fit the mold of what you expect, that they are somehow lesser than or don't deserve that opportunity. And so it's a lot of that spirit that led me to start the Building Breakthroughs class for Fluggy, which is obviously、mm-hmm. how you and I met, and why I wanted that pilot class to be focused on underrepresented founders to be able to give them. An inside look at what VCs are looking for in the companies that they back. Yeah, totally.、Um, I'm curious about like in terms of、um, having that like I guess like the at the beginning it was like really challenging for I guess like for school or like learning the language at the same time.、Um, curious like. What like how did you kind of like turn the negative energy into the positive energy to motivate yourself to、um, move things forward? Were、yeah. you always like so competitive, or like were your like basically parents like like force you to study, or like what what was the like kind of the yeah? No, it's it's、thing? a very valid question. You know, thinking back now, at the time, I'm sure I didn't appreciate it like most children. But I think what my parents really tried to instill in me is this concept that you deserve to be here just like anyone else, right? And if there's an opportunity, there's nothing that should lead you to count yourself out. And so, even though it probably took me until maybe second grade to be really proficient in English, both in terms of speaking without an accent and reading. By the time I was in fifth grade, my parents were like, "You're going to run for student government, and we'll help you, but <laughs> you should do this, right?" And my parents are big believers in not being that involved, to be frank, in、uh, in schools, right? They want me to study hard, and they are 
uh, you know, on top of me about doing my homework, but they're not exactly uh, the parents that are going to show up and volunteer at school, especially because they were both working full time. Mm -hmm. And so there was that self-starter mentality that they instilled in me combined with really high expectations. Mm -hmm. And so what I would say about, you know, whether or not I'm competitive is I'm very competitive with myself, right? I oftentimes slip, I worry, into being too hard on myself. Um, I'm much harder on myself than I am on anyone else. And so it really was this expectation that I grew up with that if there's an opportunity, A, I should always make the most of all of my opportunities because those are luxuries. There's plenty of people that didn't get the opportunities that I did, but also that I should never count myself out and I should try to pursue all the opportunities that I can. Yeah, totally. Um, curious about like, were you always, uh, because like later on your career is majorly in finance and curious about like, were you really good at math when you were younger or like, how do you like, how did it turn into this like whole financial or like VC kind of path? Yeah. So I don't know that I went into college thinking that I would do finance because to be honest, again, growing up in Pacific Grove, California, there are no investment banks. And so <laughs> I wouldn't have had exposure into the concept of Wall Street that I got much more exposure to in college. Um, growing up, I did kind of lean more into math, partly because uh, you know, even in elementary school, I wasn't that strong in English. And so I had to play to my strengths. And, and then I just kind of kept accelerating from there. Wow, I, I think that's really interesting. So like, but right now, I think you're a really great communicator. I don't know, like, maybe that have nothing to do with the English class in elementary school. But um, anyway, so like, I'm curious about like, throughout like your, um, I guess, like your career or like your um, school age, like, who do you think is on your personal board of advisor? Like, how do you make your career decisions? And like, who is like, who are these people that you consult with? Yeah. And so I'll speak about it more from a career perspective, which is, you know, I would often read stories about people who said, oh my gosh, I had this incredible mentor and they championed me. And mm -hmm. that is how I got to where I am today. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would read those stories and be like, yes, who is my person <laughs> going to be? Right. I mean, and I think that's incredible. And I'm sure those stories are amazing. And I wish that for everyone. But I think in reality, mm -hmm. those are the outliers. That's not usually what happens where mm -hmm. the founder of a firm, you know, plucks one person and says, this is going to be my legacy. Mm -hmm. And so what I've realized um, I do instead is instead think about having a council of advisors, mm -hmm. uh, where, you know, some of them are mentors that I had at Goldman, who then they themselves have left into other careers, and so could guide me through those transitions. Mm -hmm. um, and what I've also realized, more recently is that it doesn't have to be people that are more senior than me or older than me or have more tenure in the industry that I'm in. And the example that I would give is I learn a lot from the chiefs of staff that I work with at Floodgate, right? You obviously know Jay, but uh, Mitchell Kogan is one that's now a product manager at Facebook and he has design sensibilities that I could only hope for. And so when I was working with him, we would do a lot of analyses around later stage companies and I would just dump all this data on him mm -hmm. and then he would somehow translated into a way that was beautiful on the slide. So someone mm -hmm. who didn't spend 10 years in banking could understand it as well. Mm -hmm. And so I make the joke often, but it's true that anyone who spends more than 15 minutes talking to me doesn't realize it, but they become one of my life coaches where I'm always looking to learn, but not just about finance, about, you know, how to be the best version of myself. And I feel like I'm often looking to others to try to understand best practices or also just how to change my outlook to be someone who's mo more growth oriented. Yeah, totally. Um, do you see like, do you kind of like, um, I'm curious about like, how do you shape your personal network? So like, are they mostly like people also in finance? Or do you try to get like outside mentors or like peers that you chat with? Or um, just trying to understand like, how do you basically keep yourself being smart? In general? Yeah. <laughs> well, so again, you know, I take the approach where I want to know that I'm growing in all aspects of my life. And my career is obviously a big and important one of it. But to be frank, I'm more likely to be caught reading a self-help book than I am <laughs> like an, you know, a book published by Harvard Business Review. Um, and, no way. <laughs> yeah, and so what that means is that when I think about my personal network, 
I, you know, it can be based on subject matter. So it's other women that I know that are VCs, but a lot of times it's people that are in a similar stage of life, right? So I'm a mm -hmm. mom, I have two kids trying to navigate the waters of being a good role model <laughs> for them while also, you know, kind of supercharging my career, uh, being really involved at their schools. So I'm constantly looking for ways to grow in all aspects of my life. And the career is just one aspect of it. Curious about like, in terms of like the technical skills, like is there, besides, I guess besides English, like is there anything else that you feel like it's like a necessary skill that everyone should have? Uh, so I, I know you had asked me before about the transition when I went from college to banking. I went to a liberal arts school. And so the joke is mm -hmm. always, you don't actually learn anything that you can apply to your job. You just learn how to learn. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that transition, to be frank, was a rough one, right? We didn't even have accounting classes at my college. And so um, that first year in banking, to be frank, was just a grind. And I think that that's true of most people, even if they went to Wharton and had a business undergraduate degree, because there's a lot of just expectations and the bar is high for what it means to be a mm -hmm. professional investment banking. Uh, and so again, that's where I kind of lean on, okay, is this really harder than trying to learn English when people think you have a mental disability? Probably <laughs> not. Um, and, you know, on that point, I think that's the other aspect um, that my parents really instilled in me at an early age is yes, things in life are hard, but that's not a reason why you don't do them, right? Um, I've had people ask me a lot about what's it like to be a woman in venture or a woman in investment banking when it's so male dominated. My mom was a physician in the US Army, right? As a mm -hmm. Korean immigrant, naturalized US citizen. My sister went to West Point. I'm not exactly from a family that shies away from challenging environments. And you have to sometimes actually lean into that discomfort and you see it as an opportunity to grow and really just grind it out. And so in terms of you know skills, I, to be frank, like I know people think it's fun to hate on investment bankers. I think it's an incredible platform and a way that at a very young, age, you're doing a lot of reps and seeing a ton of different challenging deals and learning the pattern recognition to be able to give advice as you become more senior. Um, and from day one, especially if you're at a bulge bracket firm, you're only interacting with the C-level executives of these, you know, Fortune 500 companies. And I, I really don't know if you're interested in finance, a a similar experience other than you know going into management consulting. Yeah, totally. Is there any crash course that like if for example, I'm a founder, I'm trying to raise money in the next three months or something, like is there any crash course on the finance side of things to kind of like if I want to present to you in three months? I'm a basically I don't know anything about finance. I don't know anything about how to project my company. Um, how how should I quickly learn the skill of like kind of like summarizing what I'm doing into, I guess, like more professional language or like sure. more professional presentation, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. So the good news is, is that if you are pitching Flygate or me at the mm -hmm. seed stage, it is less about, oh, can you show me your financial projections? Because to be frank, we're early enough that you may or may not have a product that you've launched, right? So it is important mm -hmm. to us that you've thought about what will your business model ultimately be? Because, and you've heard me talk about this in our class, this concept of the minimum viable company, where it's not just about saying, I have this really cool product product or this feature or people are going to love the product. It's like, okay, how are you actually going to monetize that? And mm -hmm. so, I, you know, I would encourage you to focus more on thinking through your product and the business model, what is so compelling about the value proposition of your product that people will want to pay for it in some way. And when I say pay, mm -hmm. it's not always monetary, right? Are they going to pay for it in terms of there's a lot of friction in the onboarding process, but they're going to stick with it, right? Are they going to give you a dedicated amount of time, engagement every day? Um, and thinking through the bigger picture versus at the right time, yes, you will have to build a financial model and that's important. Um, but, you know, hopefully, at that point, you have seen investors who can help you with that. Yeah, totally. Um, anyway, going back to the career development. Um, so we talk about like, um, so basically, um, is there like, have you ever took like Wall Street prep or something similar to prepare your job? I did like, it. You know, the good news is that if you join an investment bank, they spend about two weeks, two to four weeks during the summer, just doing mm -hmm. a boot camp training for you. 
Is there any like this kind of like equivalent boot camp for like people who are not working in finance? And there probably is online, but I'm not familiar with them because I had to do it the old school way. I love it. But anyway, so let's talk about like the transition between like Goldman Sachs to Floodgate. So um, I know that in the middle, you work at a tech company in the middle for like a couple months. And tell us more about like the transition about going from Wall Street to venture investing. Yeah. So um, when I left Goldman, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. But one of the ideas was that I do come from a family that does a lot of public service. And so, mm-hmm. you know, I talked about both my sister and my mom served in the U.S. Army. My brother has been a general counsel for over 10 years at a microfinance organization called Kiva. And so this concept of having almost like a second career where you're more oriented towards somehow serving uh, either your country or uh, mm-hmm. giving back in some ways is something my family really believes in. And so in my mind, I think I had always thought the transition after Goldman would be I go and work in a nonprofit. And I really did want to work at a mission oriented company. And so I went to a group called Sama Source, uh, which is this amazing nonprofit that at least at the time was focused on creating digital work opportunities for talented women and refugees in places like Kenya and Uganda, where mm-hmm. they're English proficient, usually college educated, but there's not a lot of local work opportunities for them. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was a really interesting operating experience because even though it's a nonprofit and so really looking for grants, in terms of the work, they were competing against, you know, Mechanical Turk, Crowdflower, and a lot of other uh, venture-backed startups. And so Mm -hmm. the pace of building and shipping product was fairly intense. Uh, And so I'm glad that I had that opportunity to actually get more operating experience. I was there for about a year as the head of business operations, which was a catch-all title for Mm -hmm. anything and everything. You know, I built their business model. I do a lot of their hiring, Mm -hmm. reviewing of legal contracts. Um, And then I switched over to Flightgate where Mm -hmm. I had first come in as a partner that was more focused on everything outside of investing. And so um, building out kind of a network of corporate contacts, taking on board seats, so I'm um, helping our companies think through exit opportunities. And then mm-hmm. over the last couple of years, we have devised a new strategy where we run our reserves as if they were an opportunity fund and proactively seek out opportunities to potentially increase our ownership over time. So that's when we're more where I've been narrowly focused. Yeah, totally. Curious about if I'm a startup and that I want to kind of like build these kind of corp dev relationships or something with a big company, um, how should I go about it? Because, um, as a startup, I may not really have like anything that I can contribute to say Mm -hmm. Google of the worlds. Um, like how do I position myself as a meaningful partner to get have like an ongoing relationship? Then if I just get coffee with them once that that's maybe easy, but like, how do you kind of like ongoing, um, like build an ongoing relationship with uh, the team there? Yeah, and this is where it's in some sense easier to develop that relationship if you're a VC, because I probably mm-hmm. have a portfolio of companies that might be relevant to a company like Google mm-hmm. versus if you're just representing yourself. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, people in the startup ecosystem are of two minds about corp dev relationships, right? Paul Graham mm-hmm. kind of wrote a very um, well known blog post basically saying don't ever engage with them. Um, but I'm of a different mindset, probably because mm-hmm. I grew up in investment banking, working with corp dev leaders. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> When corp dev is done well at a company, it is not right. about, no worries, the former mm-hmm. investment bankers coming in and executing on your deals. It's about people who are thinking very strategically and partnering with the GMs to better understand mm-hmm. what is the trajectory of a business and where can they have organic versus inorganic growth. Um, and you know they can have a very symbiotic relationship with VCs where I like to meet with them and be able to say, here's what we're seeing in terms of you know, new and cutting edge technology mm-hmm. that's probably going to be relevant for you. Mm -hmm. How much of this is already on your five-year roadmap and is being built internally versus might Mm -hmm. there be opportunities for you to partner with one of our companies? And when I say partner, I really do mean that, right? I'm not coding it to mean like, do you Mm -hmm. want to acquire one of our companies? As you know, when Floodgate invests, it is always with the hope and expectation that Mm -hmm. the company can be standalone worth more than a billion dollars and go public. We're not looking to make 
quick, quick exits via M&A. And mm -hmm. so what I would say is that if you are a startup founder trying to develop those relationships, my hope for you is the reason why you want to develop the relationships is because, again, Corp Dev Done Well serves as your Sherpa within an organization, right? And so that's where we've had the benefit of Floodgate being able to say, oh, if you're having an issue with like an app store somewhere, like maybe we can find you the right person to help us better understand what we did wrong and how we can address mm -hmm. the concern, not because we're saying, hey, Corp Dev, can you visit this company and see if you'd want to acquire it? Anyway, so I think you mentioned a great point that like VCs normally can kind of build relationships like in a box in, essentially is so like, um, so that may be meaningful for the Corp Dev team to take the meeting or like keep going on, uh, build like a keep going, like well, long-term relationships with them. Um, so as a startup founder, like how do I like take this advice and then like sort of do something similar? Yeah, well, so what I will say is that a lot of the larger organizations, so for example, mm -hmm. Google and Amazon in particular, actually now have programs that are intended to make them more easily accessible and easier to navigate for startup mm -hmm. founders. Mm -hmm. And so that may be probably the easiest entry point versus going the corp dev route. Yeah, totally. Like what kind of program are they like startup like, I think I saw on Google, there was like engineering courses, but I don't know. Like... Well, so the ones that I'm thinking of usually come with free credits. So for mm -hmm. Google Cloud or AWS. And then mm -hmm. if you need help getting introductions to certain different business lines within, for example, Google. I mean, I, I can only imagine that's incredibly challenging to try to figure out the right person to speak with. And they can be your Sherpa within Google to try to help you get in touch with the right people. Yeah, totally. Thank you. That's like, that's good to know. Thank you. So in terms of like getting into a VC or breaking into a VC, um, you recently did a talk at Wharton and you mentioned about like you are, uh, when you were trying to get into a VC, you are competing with like the executives from like the big tech companies. Curious on like, how do you, um, I guess, like find your advantage um, mm -hmm. through like, and then how do you kind of like uh, basically coming up with a strategy to compete with someone who is also like really great in some other areas. Yeah, no, and I think that this is a really important lesson that I learned, which mm -hmm. is when I was interviewing at Floodgate, I'd mm -hmm. already spent, you know, more than 10 years in investment banking. And I'd also gone mm -hmm. to business school and also spent like a year in early stage venture before business school. And so mm -hmm. I was just personally at a stage in my life where I was no longer willing to fake it until I make it right. Like I'm always looking for opportunities to grow, but I was very clear with Floodgate. If you're looking for a partner because I had been investment banker, for example, that you think I can be dropped in as a CFO for your companies, mm -hmm. that's not me. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not me because, you know, I didn't grow up in accounting, nor do I really, mm -hmm. to be frank, have an interest in, in playing that role. Mm -hmm. And so what it meant, though, is that I needed to convince Floodgate that they were looking for me, even if they didn't know it. And mm -hmm. so for me, what that meant is I pitched them on this idea of venture capitalists love deploying capital. Right. That's kind of where mm -hmm. all the glory is, is I wrote mm -hmm. a first check into company X, Y and Z. I, what I suspect is happening, though, is that a lot of VCs write that check and then they figure, you know, there's just a lot of luck in it. And now it's up to the company to be able to execute against expectations mm -hmm. and then there'll be an IPO someday versus, you know, I had spent, again, my almost entire career up until that point coaching CEOs through sell side processes or IPOs and working with them for example, in you know two years in advance of an IPO to get them a public company CFO and then get an audit chair and make sure they were having well uh, audited financials and helping them mm -hmm. do M&A in advance of that so they could get at a scale where they could actually go public. Mm -hmm. And so I'm much more of a believer that exits are intentional, right? Even these mm -hmm. concepts of, oh my God, did you see overnight this company was a success or became acquired? Those conversations had probably been going on for a minimum of two years. And so mm -hmm. my pitch to Mike and Ann at the time was, you guys are best in class at writing the checks, but I think you're now at a stage of maturity in the fund where we need to start thinking about harvesting exits. And whether we like it or not, right, it's in my DNA that every opportunity I see, even at the first pitch, I'm thinking through, is there an exit 
a path for this company. And if there's not, then I wish them well, but they should probably bootstrap instead of taking on venture funding. And if there is an exit path, what does that mean? And how do we make sure that they're correctly on that path? In practice, what that means now is I'm very clear when I start working with a company, you need to have a fundraising roadmap in the same way that you have a product roadmap, right? Meaning mm -hmm. that if you know you're going to become a billion dollar company, how much capital does that require? And based on how much capital that will influence which kind of investors you're going after and how much you raise in each round and what the milestones are that are going to justify the round size and the valuation that you're looking for. Um, and mm -hmm. it's a lot like the public markets where you should be both be getting credit for what you've achieved thus far, but it's really the trajectory of what any investor that's coming in now is going to be able to ride the upside in that should get people mm -hmm. excited about investing. Yeah. Oh my God. I feel like that just, I, that's like a, such a great pitch. Um, and I'm curious about um, when you are looking at a startup, how do you come up with a strategy for them to exit? Or like, how do you see something play out? Um, like, can you give us an example in like maybe consumer tech and one in like enterprise, just because um, they're so different? Um, yeah, just curious. Yeah. And so, you know, we've talked about it in our class that historically, mm -hmm. a lot of times uh, people would think about, for example, with a consumer app, like if I build it, they will mm -hmm. come, right? All I care mm -hmm. about is audience. Mm -hmm. And uh, I could put you on the spot and see if you learned from the class. Oh, gosh. Uh -huh. <laughs> but, yeah. you know, the danger in that is mm -hmm. historically those models really just defaulted to advertising, right? Monetizing mm -hmm. the audience that you had. And mm -hmm. that's obviously much harder to do these days because the likelihood that you can monetize an audience better than Instagram, Facebook, Snap, Twitter, right? It, it's just mm -hmm. going to be challenging, especially as a startup. And so that's why we really think it's important that even in the early days, mm -hmm. yes, you should be focused on product, but you need to have some sense for what the business model is going to look like. Mm -hmm. And so when I talk about, you know, is there a path to an exit for a company? It's talking about a couple of things. One is like, can this company actually scale? And here's where oftentimes we will see a founder that sometimes almost seems like he or she is building technology for technology's sake, where mm -hmm. it's really cool. I'm sure it's incredibly challenging, but what is the actual business application, right? Like how is a business is going to be convinced that they need this and they should put dollars mm -hmm. behind it versus it's a nice to have. Mm -hmm. And so is there enough that this company isn't just going to be a feature or one product, but can it actually scale and grow and then have multiple products that again, it's going to be worth more than a billion dollars someday, mm -hmm. because it's rare that a company goes public with only one product and it's the same product that they started off with at the very beginning. And so most companies that expectation is that they become to a certain extent a platform where there's mm -hmm. multiple products that are being offered. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the consumer side, I think it's around, uh, you know, similarly, will there be either enough scale in terms of audience or enough ancillary products that get it get added on that the level of engagement and then the ability to, or to potential to monetize because of that engagement will continue to grow over time right will this team mm -hmm. be able to continue to innovate and come up with either enhancements to their existing product or more products that will keep mm -hmm. drawing the users back in versus there have been a lot of businesses that it's kind of like the one hit wonder when it comes to music or songs mm -hmm. that were exciting for a period of time versus will they continue to advance their product so people feel the need to keep coming back and it becomes a daily use case ideally. Yeah, totally. So curious about like, what's a day to day like for you at Blockgate? Yeah, so my day to day, oftentimes on any given day, I'll have at least one board meeting, right? And so um, we coach, especially newer members of our team that when you think about your your evolution as an investor, there's a lot of emphasis that's placed, especially I feel like the uh, urban legend around like associates mm -hmm. is that like you got to bring in good deals right and obviously that's important mm -hmm. so the concept of do you know about deals that are happening can you actually decide when it's a good deal and then can you win with a term sheet right because obviously term sheets are given it doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to be the person that gets the lead or the allocation but then once you do the deal then it's the hard work of actually being a, a good board member right are you going to be able to help this company stay on track, accelerate, fundraise, all that. And then ultimately, hopefully you can also help the company exit at some point. And so a lot of my 
day-to-day -day responsibility mm -hmm. is around the second half of that. I still mm -hmm. source deals, but because of the way we've constructed our roles and responsibilities, even if I source a deal, I'll hand it over. I've handed one over to Arjun. I've handed one over to Anne. I don't think I've handed one over to Mike yet. And they'll write the first check in to allow me to a certain extent to have a, a degree of neutrality for when they do their, their next round of funding. And then every check after that first one in theory comes from my checkbook. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's where I spend a lot of my time is I get to know the founders, if not in the pitch process. And as soon as we actually write that first check in, and I'm working with them to my earlier comment around fundraising roadmap. When they think that they're ready to fundraise, I'm kind of their first pitch at right and helping them set up their data room, build their financial model, prepping them for what the diligence process is going to look like, making intros, right? And hopefully I'm spending my time in the background talking to the Series A and B investors to better understand what are the sectors they're looking at, what are the metrics that they're honed in on that would make them excited about an opportunity, facilitating those types of introductions. And then also thinking from a portfolio management perspective, mm -hmm. evaluating, you know, where do I want to place my bets in terms mm -hmm. of what is the maximum return that I can get for, for Floodgate based on all the follow-on investing that we do. Yeah, totally. So talking about like the following rounds, so is there any patterns for like, is that like the most hyped portfolio company gets a follow around funding or like, how do you evaluate it? Just because um, a lot of times, like in terms of early stage, a lot of company pivot even after maybe series B or something. Yeah. Um, how do you predict what's going to happen in the future? Yeah, no, um, it's definitely not a science. It's an art and it's one that we're holding ourselves accountable to keep <laughs> evolving. And yeah. so, you know, in, in two years, I may have a very different point of view than I do today. Um, but right now, I think the part that's challenging is that it's not just a one-off check. It's one check that is part of a portfolio strategy. And what I mean by that is to your question about, do we naturally follow on into the most hyped companies? Not necessarily, because if we did our jobs well in the first check that we wrote, then ideally we got our target ownership, which most times is you know greater than 10%, hopefully ideally like 15% or above. And if the company goes to let's say, you know 100 million very quickly, then we actually don't suffer that much dilution by not participating. And I have to think about mm -hmm. the opportunity cost of any money I put into that company. What is the likelihood that I will get a higher return versus another company that's about to raise their Series A that may be raising at you know 50 million and maybe they have just as much potential but they're in a sector that's not getting as much hype as the first company mm -hmm. and so there's those trade-offs that we're constantly balance, balancing there's also the life cycle of the fund meaning that companies that we invest in early in their life cycle are obviously going to come back up for follow-on investing mm -hmm. uh, before we've even fully deployed first checks in the first one so trying to have a sense for do i have enough conviction about the companies i've already seen that i'm willing to pour my money in in before I have an opportunity to see other companies that are going to come back up for funding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. So in terms of the founder characteristics, like, do you see any patterns from like what they've done before? Are those like going to be like the big company PMs or like, are, is there like no regular pattern? Um, so I'm also curious about, I've seen company recently, like, I think 45 episodes I had, I chatted with Fabrice Green that like, basically he was talking about like, um, a company called Slice. Um, it's like a pizza app. So it started by like mm -hmm. a guy actually just own a pizza store. And then he created the app for himself to like deliver pizza. And then eventually like all the local pizza people come up, just use the same app. And then like, you know, after, so now it's like already raised like Series C or something like that. So those are like people who didn't have like the formal engineering or like PM background or don't even live in Silicon Valley. I think their app is like in Long Island, but curious about like, so there's like unusual paths of founders or, and like, or like, I guess like this, the expertise users, because yeah. they are like in the pizza sector, then um, the regular like tech sector, but is, do you see any trends going like from, you know, people who just work in a particular industry and then do some innovation there? Or like, do you think it's more like people who um, had like re really legit like PMing background or like worked in tech or stuff like that? Yeah, no, I think it's a, a very legitimate question and one that we get asked often because VCs are about 
pattern recognition in large part, mm -hmm. right? And so what I would say is that when we look at founders, we do often ask ourselves this question of why, why is this the right team to get done what they are hoping to achieve? And when we say that though, it's less about or it could be all of these, right? Industry expertise, mm -hmm. um, functional expertise. It's uh, a visceral pain point that they feel every day. And so they're almost have an emotional attachment to say, if not for me, no one else is going to solve this. And like, God damn it, someone's got to solve it, right? And so what I would say is that it's not like we can check the box on which one applies for, mm -hmm. for which founder or which opportunity, but we need to know that there's a compelling reason why the, this is the right team. And so to the example you talked talked about with Slice, I think, you know, it was maybe they grew up in the industry, meaning their family mm -hmm. owned a bunch of pizzerias and they saw that it, why couldn't, I think, you know, part of the pitch is why can a local pizza place be able to dominate the way the Domino's does? And so mm -hmm. they saw firsthand what the opportunity was and probably built the product in a way that was fairly user-friendly for mm -hmm. the pizza shop owners. And so I think that Yes, in terms of a founding team, you want to have a good balance of people who are technical, probably at least one person that's more business oriented. But I think we're fairly open minded in wanting to assess what about this founding team is going to be the reason why they actually succeed. Yeah. What would be like some common reason? Like are those, for example, if I'm a startup, well, I am a startup founder, I guess, like I'm curious about like, how do I evaluate what's my strong suit of something? Because for example, I have multiple um, ideas on like a particular sector. Like how do I pick which one is like the best for me to execute? Yeah, I think part of it is also knowing that whatever you choose, chances are you're basically saying, I'm going to do this for the next 10 years of my life, right? I mean, that founder <laughs> commitment is not to be taken lightly. I was just in a board meeting yesterday with mm -hmm. a founder who dropped out of college uh, to start his company. He's 12 years in, right? When we met him. Oh, I thought he really... was 12 years old. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm sure there's other people of like field fellows who have backed 12 year olds, but uh you know, when we met him, he was a college student. Since then, he's gotten married. He's a father to two children, right? It's like 12 years for someone who was maybe in their early 20s when we met them. That's a significant span of their lives. And, and I say that in some sense, as a cautionary tale that when you're a founder, it's very hard to ever quit your startup, right? And hopefully we backed you, you wouldn't because we would have kind of rightly assessed that this is such a passion of yours that you wouldn't be able to easily walk away. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, yes, you should definitely think about it from the lens of what is my superpower where I'm going to be differentiated and being able to make this company a success. But it's also important that you are going to be energized enough by the opportunity that being a founder is hard, right? And even the most successful companies, we joke, had near and not at least nine near death experiences. And what is going to allow you to have the resilience that you are going to still wake up every day excited for the opportunity to keep forging ahead the okay. high bar I know <laughs> <laughs> that's deep <laughs> anyway so in terms of like the technical part of like VC financing is there any like VC lingo 101 for like the founders that are like more in the more entry level of um, the funding journey yeah, no, I think it's important for founders, especially if they're looking to fundraise, to educate themselves on term sheet basics, right? Um, mm -hmm. And yes, the, you'll probably engage counsel and they will paper it for you, but it's important that you understand the difference, for example, between pre-money versus post-money and mm -hmm. that that will highly impact how much dilution you're taking, right? Mm -hmm. Why there should be an option pool and what the rates are of investors that are coming in. Um, you know, I worry that a lot of founders oftentimes Times, um, don't weigh heavily enough how important the decision is of who they let onto their cap table because you can't force someone off who's an investor in your company. I mean, I, it's kind of a crass joke, but it's much easier to divorce your spouse than it is to get rid of an investor. There is no kind of legal arrangement by which, and so you're stuck with them, but it can be tempting in the moment to say, I'm going to go with whoever gives me the highest valuation or the largest check size or who got to the finish line the fastest but you have to understand that person is going to be with you and be a significant owner of your company until the very end. And so you want to go into that process being incredibly thoughtful about who's gonna be the right partner for you in this journey. 
in terms of like picking the i guess like i don't think a lot of startups have the leverage to pick who their investor is unless you're like you know one of the top five people i, I don't know in the industry like how do we navigate the like fundraising journey when we don't really have much choices we just take whatever we got yeah let's talk about a more extreme example so if you find yourself uh with only one term sheet and it's someone with whom you don't see yourself being able to partner there is a very real question of should you just decline fundraising find a way to bootstrap and or you know raise money from friends and family, cut your burn, assuming it's, you know, more than just you and say, I'm going to do this my way for another six months and try to fundraise again, right? Because six months in a startup's life cycle is a complete generation. And so you can be in a very different position because part of it is also dynamics that may not be necessarily just reflective of you or your company. Think about COVID, right? I mean, the fundraising environment in March or April was very different than it is now. Now it's much more well Coming. There's a lot of up rounds getting done. March and April, people were probably reticent to write a check, not knowing what the economic outlook was going to look like. And so that's always a possibility um, is you decide, okay, I thought I could move faster by fundraising, but I'm going to have to make do without it and focus on capital efficiency, even though I'm just at the beginning of my journey. Um, and then for others, I think, you know, fundraising, yes, when you are a seed or early stage company, part of the benefit of taking a check from a VC is in some ways you get the leverage of their brand, right? They're signaling as you're trying to recruit, as you're trying to raise your next round of funding to be able to say, mm -hmm. I am a floodgate company. That mm -hmm. having been said, I think it's also important to recognize that who is actually going to be interacting with you day to day is mm -hmm. the partner that's leading the investment. And so it may mean in the same way that that VC is taking a chance on you as a first time founder, you are taking a chance on that VC who is you know, maybe lesser known or earlier in their journey. But there is plenty of examples, right, of first time founders and first time VCs that end up having incredible outcomes in terms of you know, IPOs. And so I think that everybody kind of has to go in with a mentality of wanting to find the rat right match for them, regardless of the halo effect um, that a brand name can bring with them. Yeah, totally. Curious about like, how do you find the right VC for you? If we're looking at like, if my startup is not that terrible, so I got two term sheets, <laughs> but like, how do I kind of like find the right fit for me? Because it's really hard to know someone when you just have like one conversation with them. And I assume other founders would just tell you like, oh, he or she is great. So like, um, curious, how do you like find out if this person have like the right resources as well as like can vibe with you in mm -hmm. like many situations? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, most of VCs as they're diligencing you, it's going to go anywhere like three plus meetings, right? And so I think you will get a good sense for from them as to where they're focused mm -hmm. and where they're going to push you. And you're going to have to assess for yourself like, okay, do I like the types of questions and how they ask their questions? Will this person actually encourage me to be a better CEO and founder and keep pushing more product? Or are they just going to be money that's on my cap table, but they'll stay out of the way, right? And, and you have to solve for what you're looking for. And then there's just the very kind of practical tactics of uh, checking on your VC, which is you can always ask the VC for references, uh, but then you should I, I encourage founders to explicitly ask for references where they had to shut down their company. Because if you are speaking to a founder who's had an incredible exit, there's always going to be a little bit of revisionist history, right? It's just human nature mm -hmm. versus if you talk to a founder who had to shut down their company, it will give you a sense for the actual character of the VC. And, uh, you know, at least at Flygate, our commitment to you is that we will be in the foxhole with you. And again, we are your co-conspirators. And so whether it's ringing the bell in the New York Stock Exchange for you, we'll be there to celebrate. And if it's you having to just shut down your company will help you navigate that as well that brings me to like my next question i'm curious about 
like there's a myth of like I've heard the statistics are like oh you know 95% startup fail but like how many percentage of like startup fail when they're backed by like a good VC yeah you know I've heard that stat as well and I don't think it's that extreme unless you're talking to I think what you're your point, which is a lot of those startups probably never raised venture funding, mm -hmm. or they may be more what we think about as SMBs and not necessarily software powered startups. Mm -hmm. I think what's much more likely to be the case is I think there's another stat that says um, somewhere along the lines of only maybe half or 60% of uh, VC backed startups ever return the money that they raised. And oh, so that's it may, really high. I'm sorry. <laughs> so it may not be that they fail as in they shut down, but for example, yeah. maybe they don't exit, right? Maybe the fundraising environment for them dried up. And so mm -hmm. they had to become, uh, you know, cash flow positive and they're basically just kind of break even, but they're neither growing nor able to get more investment mm -hmm. to actually flourish. Uh, and so I think that's probably more what's likely or that they're a large enough um, exit that they can actually move the needle on a portfolio's returns. Wow, that's uh, way better than I thought. <laughs> It's like 95%. That's a lot. Um, so for the 40% that people kind of like fail or like just like the company shut down or something, where does a founder go? Do they go work at Google or like curious what is like the general pattern of these? Yeah, failures? so you will see founders, especially if it's a smaller team, be able to basically get their team aqua hired. And uh, with that, in those types of situations, at, at least more recently, there's usually not really return to the investors. It's just about a team that's already worked together that will interview as a group to be hired into one of the larger tech companies. Um, and otherwise, you know, the other situation that we see that's not uncommon is the company shuts down um, and everyone just kind of finds their own way. And you'll see founders, to your point, either then just get hired into a larger company. Oftentimes at that point, they're looking for more stability. So they're not necessarily going to go join a startup where they're not CEO, or they'll stop, take some time and then launch their ne next company, right? There's some CEOs or mm -hmm. founders who kind of just, it, it's in their blood and they can't not be an entrepreneur. And so <laughs> after they take a little bit of, uh, of a break and clear their minds, we'll come up with the next idea. Curious about like, cause we can only see the really successful ones that a lot of people are like the first time, like we only hear about their most successful projects mm -hmm. or product. Um, before like the Twitter guy become the Twitter guy or like the Lyft guy become the Lyft guys, um, did they start it like multiple startup and failed or like were they just like just successful right away? Curious yeah. on their I mean, journey. to be honest, the successes are always the outliers anyways, right? And so um, the reason why I point that out is because then what I'm going to talk about is even more extreme where it's the outliers for the outliers, right? And so yeah. a classic example there would be Stuart Butterfield, who just mm -hmm. uh, sold Slack to Salesforce mm -hmm. for a very high premium. It's an incredible exit. And that's obviously after he had already taken Slack public. Um, but, you know, Slack as a company started off as a gaming company, mm -hmm. and it was really communication tool that was internal and mm -hmm. that when they realized that the gaming company wasn't doing well they decided to mm -hmm. make a go of somehow then instead monetizing the communication tool and so I think that yes there are founders who had had multiple you know maybe failed attempts at startups and then go on to launch something that's incredible but I think that there's I'm more familiar with examples of founders who end up finding success after the company that they had already started sometimes just doesn't become big. It's not necessarily that it's mm -hmm. a failure and then they pivot and then that company becomes huge. Um, there's two other examples I think of. The Lyft founders, obviously, when we invested in them, were actually running a company called Zimride, which I think of as carpooling mm -hmm. software for campuses and corporates. And it was a good business, but it wasn't going to be the scale of Lyft, right? But it mm -hmm. was two and a half years in after they had launched Zimride that they decided to start the ride-sharing economy and it became something much bigger. Um, and the other example, 
example is justin.tv, right? And, and people love to think about like, oh God, these four friends, you know, <laughs> sold their company for a billion dollars. They were grinding it out for several years. And when it was justin.tv, they couldn't even get it funded. Mm -hmm. So they actually had to become profitable. And then the business that became Twitch had only been live for about a year before they sold it to Amazon for close to a billion dollars. But that was maybe year seven in their journey. Uh, and so people can look at Twitch and say, oh, it was an overnight success. It was only around for a year. But Twitch was the outcome of them having already grounded out with Justin.TV and social cam for the six years prior. Yeah, totally. Well, thank you so much, Aris. Um, so we're at the one minute fire round session. Oh my goodness. I didn't know this was a thing. <laughs> I'll sit up in my chair. <laughs> um, so the first question is, what's your favorite book? So I love this book called Quiet. And it's oh, yeah, you know, a friend it. of mine Susan had actually, Susan yes, wrote it. And she yeah. had introduced it to me because I'm, I think of myself as an introvert, but I learned social skills like anybody else says to survive. Uh, but my older son, especially when he was younger, was just very quiet. And it, <laughs> as a parent, it's very uncomfortable when you're parenting a child who seems different than you. And in reading the book, just understanding the strength of people who are comfortable actually being quiet and being able to observe. And I'm, I always joke, like, especially when I was in banking, which is obviously a client service business, that I'm very uncomfortable with silence and feel the need to fill that gap. Yeah. And so it was very enlightening for me to be able to understand, again, the strength of people and also what their needs are. I actually do feel like I may be someone who was an extreme introvert then because I concentrate best in a vacuum by myself, you know, no white noise. I just need to be able to focus and crank something out. Uh, and so I just, again, I, I appreciate any opportunity to have my eyes open to, to um, new thoughts and new profiles. Yeah, totally. Um, who made the biggest impact in your career? So this is a tough one. Um, and, you know, it would be a ton of fun if I was able to name some, you know, Fortune 100 CEO or some <laughs> Midas list VC. But to be frank, I think it's my mom, right? Again, for mm -hmm. her to be, you know, think about their generation of Korean women. A lot of families weren't exactly investing in their daughters to go to college, much, much less medical school. And then for her to leave Korea and all of her family to come to the U.S. for residency mm -hmm. and then to give up being a... Uh, doctor and a professor at the Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania to join the U.S. Army, there are kind of no boundaries to what she thought was possible. And that's something that I still strive for every day, that she has much more of this mentality. And she was a very involved mother to three children. Um, being a working mom is hard, right? I, I admit that humbly every day. But to be able to have someone who role modeled for me that there should be no constraints, that I have to choose one thing or another or feel Feel like I'm opting out because of the priorities that I've placed is something that's kind of incredible. Yeah, totally. Who would you invite to your dinner party? Oh, this is so much fun. Uh, so <laughs> I think that, I mean, honestly, at this point, it's like anyone because <laughs> with quarantine, I would just love social interaction. But again, you know, I think about it as I love the people that I've discovered in my life that have become my trusted advisors. And 2020 for me, it's funny because it's been a year of experiments. Um, and maybe it is because we've been quarantining. And so I've got the benefit of having daily check-ins with my team, but I'm not actually physically in an office with them. So it's allowed me a little bit of the distance to say, I'm gonna try things that don't feel comfortable for me and, and evolve as a person. So launching the Building Breakthroughs class was one aspect of that. Uh, my doing these market musings on Twitter is also something that's very new for me. I'm, I'm a very private person. I'm not really on social media uh, and I'm also okay with that, but I have a lot of friends who have been pushing me to try to grow my uh, social media presence more or just put myself out there more, right? You being one of them. <laughs> and so um, I feel like, you know, I would want to have a dinner party with all the people that are uh, my cheerleaders in the background that push me to, keep evolving myself and um, trying to become the best version of myself. Yeah. Um, where can we find you when you're not at work? Yeah. So if anyone needs to reach me, uh, I can be easily found at Flygate. And otherwise, it's, you know, find me on Twitter if you want to reach out to me. I'm just at Donuts Did This. Uh, but otherwise, in my non-work persona, I'm mostly outdoors with my two boys running around. Nice. 
Okay, awesome, amazing. Thank you so much, Iris, for coming on the show today. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. If you enjoyed today's episode, please hit the subscribe button so you don't miss out. Have a wonderful day.